artist Jennifer Anderson, who will invite you into her studio where she will talk about the importance of play in her practice. Anderson often gives herself many art challenges as a way to combat the pressure of creating work that she deems as frameworthy. More recently, Jennifer decided to play with some very non-traditional art making tools in order to loosen up and let go, enjoying the process of mark, mark making, <clears throat> exploring some new subject matter and creating a new piece in this medium every day for a hundred days. Jennifer comes from New England, but she has made Monterey her home in the past 14 years. She's traditionally a trained printmaker. Jennifer has found her artistic voice expanding in the recent years with explorations in watercolor and oil painting. She is currently an artist at the Cornell Art Association where she also serves on the board. And I want everyone to help me welcome Jennifer, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you. Well, thanks for having me, everyone. This is definitely a special treat. It's always fun to share what we do. I think we actually learn a little bit about ourselves and about our process when we share it. So that's a really great thing, I think. So when you get to talk about your work, uh, a couple of things happen. One, you learn a little bit about more about why you do what you do in, in just talking about it. And you also you learn a, bit, a little bit more about how people perceive your work, which then informs you, I think. So I, I enjoy this. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm going to start off with um, a little slideshow. I have about, I think, 10 or 12 slides, and I'll just kind of talk about uh, different ways that I've progressed from printmaking into watercolors. And then I'm going to uh, shift gears and do a demo for you. I have these beautiful tulips here <laughs> that I'm going to uh, attempt to draw and uh, add some color to in front of you live. So that'll be interesting and not nerve wracking at all, right? <laughs> okay, I'm gonna share my screen. And so if you have questions that come up, I honestly now don't remember if you're just gonna unmute yourself and ask the question and then I answer or if Desiree is going to manage that. Desiree, could you remind us how we're gonna do that? Yeah, sure. If you guys want to write your questions in chat, I can read them, read them out, or you can ask her directly and Jennifer will answer. Right. Okay. Okay. So that sounds great. So, and you can interrupt me anytime. It doesn't have to be at the end of something or whatever. Okay. So let me just get share screen up and pull this up and There, does everyone see that? Okay, so like Desiree said, I started off, I'm a traditionally uh, trained printmaker. And I guess what that means is that I studied printmaking and learned how to edition and all the important parts of being a traditional printmaker, where anything that you wanted in the image was actually the result of printmaking. And so I, I, I graduated with a BFA in printmaking and then was a printmaker for many years. And that's how I identified at myself as an artist. And it was easier to say I was a printmaker than to say I was an artist. Uh, I don't know why, I think there was just less, it felt more comfortable. Uh, in the last 14 years here, I've focused in from Monterey, I've focused primarily on dry point printmaking and woodcuts. And that's mostly due to studio restrictions that you know I don't have a full on printmaking studio that I have access to. And so for those of you unfamiliar with any printmaking, these are a few a couple of dry points here. And dry point printmaking is when you're doing direct mark making right into a copper or a zinc or a plexiglass plate. And you're scratching and gouging your image directly into the plate, then rubbing ink into those grooves and then pulling an impression from it. And so uh, I mark making is a super important part of my art practice. I love mark making, I love direct mark making and dry point printmaking is all about direct mark making. I mean, what you see is what you get. Every mark you scratch and carve into the plate is what you get when you print it. And I love, and I, you guys, as all artists, I'm sure you can relate to this. We always tend, I, I always would tend to be much more loose and expressive in my sketches then, then I would tighten up when it came to final work or going on to the good paper. And I have made a, in, a very deliberate intention to try to not let that happen. And so in my dry points, I work on plexiglass because plexiglass is readily available and not expensive at all. 
And it allows me to not feel like the material is, is too precious to mess up. So I never have that feeling, oh, I'm going to mess up. And so I'm able to like loosen up and just and, and work freely and loosely. And so these, those are all, these are all examples of dry point printmaking. And the kestrel on the right there is uh, actually printed on watercolor paper. And then I added uh, uh, pools of watercolor uh, tone afterwards, after it was printed. Uh, and so, yeah, and so then uh, most of my printmaking being all in black and white, I felt like I was a little bit too restricted. And so I decided uh, in my 50th year to do 50 days, here's one of my little mini challenges, 50 days of watercolors, of only working in watercolor. And that led to a whole new body of work and a whole new direction for me, which was watercolor painting and really honing in on uh, bird imagery and uh, compositions that were really all about the bird and not about anything in their environment. So I did a lot of, I just, I have, if you, if you know my, if you're familiar with my work, you know that I don't put in a lot of environmental background or whatever, uh, but really focus on the bird form and on color and abstracting parts and finding details, like the eyes are super important to me and finding detail in the areas that I found super interesting working with uh, handmade watercolors, which tend to have a lot of granulation because they're made from minerals and just really a lot of fun in playing with these and playing, but that it was really that initial 50 days of playing with watercolor that led me in this direction, which I had no idea was gonna happen. So that was really an exciting kind of turning point for me becoming prime, you know, changing from being only a printmaker to now feeling like, oh, I have a whole nother, another, a whole other way of making work, which was fantastic. And then uh, in 2019, I was uh, encouraged by a gallery in the Midwest. They were interested in my work, but they wanted, you know, they didn't want the stark white backgrounds. And I don't know, I think as artists, sometimes when someone tells you to do something, you're a little more reluctant to do it. <laughs> At least I am. Uh, but I was like, they wanted more illustrated, like a narrative of the background. And I just wasn't into that. But anyway, it did push me to think more about what I was doing. And so in my sketchbooks, I started first just working with watercolor, like the birds, the bird imagery, and then just doing these abstracted tonal backgrounds. And so these are two pieces uh, that were a result of that whole exploration. And now I'm happy to say I'm very comfortable going either way. I'm really, ha I'm really comfortable sticking with the white backgrounds in my watercolors or putting in abstracted tone, which really, I don't make a decision prior to working on the piece, which way it's gonna go. It really kind of evolves as the piece evolves. And so, but what I like a lot about, um, about doing this is the, the tones that I use, I try to work with high contrast. So the birds really pop forward. Um, and, and, you know, pull away or, or look like they're emerging from that abs more abstracted background. And so speaking of, well, so the sketchbooks, like I said earlier, I started playing. The sketchbooks are another big place where I play with imagery and I play with materials. And I don't know if you guys, if you all keep sketchbooks, but I've, I've been keeping, keeping sketchbooks for years, not with the intent of ever showing anybody any of them, until the last few years when I started realizing that there was a volume of work there. And if people did see them, uh, the response uh, was very positive and people were really interested in knowing what I was doing in my sketchbooks and looking through them, which I found very interesting. That was something I hadn't like thought was an interesting to anybody before. Uh, sketchbooks, as you know, can be a super intimate part of our art making. And I think for me, it was a, it's another place for me to play with different mediums and different styles and write down notes and write down, you know, musings or poetry and really kind of the whole experience of making the art that isn't really necessarily what you would share, uh, like when you talk about things, you know, it's just, and so, so the collection of sketchbooks really, um, became, well, not the collection, but the, the process of working in sketchbooks became more and more important over the years in terms of like a daily practice where I work with gouache, I work with pen and ink, I work with pencil, graphite, a variety of things, a lot from observation and a lot also from photographs where I'm just working with new imagery and new materials. 
And so that's another part, another way that I play in art is in my sketchbooks, which led to these pieces, which is what I'm gonna kind of demonstrate today. So uh, I don't know if you're on social media, you may or may not have heard of the 100 day project. Uh, lots of artists do it, they kind of do it whenever they want throughout the year, but I think it's usually launched kind of more officially in uh, January sometime in there. And it's where you like the, the little mini challenges that Desiree mentioned. This is another one where I was like, okay, I'm gonna do this because something always good comes out of when I challenge myself. <laughs> I always end up with a new direction or something that I wouldn't have thought to do if I really commit to working with something for a continue for a, like a, a period of time. And so I have all this paper in my studio, which has just been piling up. So I've got, you know, cold press paper, hot press watercolor paper. I've got bristle board. I've got multimedia paper. And just like, I'm not using it. I want to use it. And I have lots of different inks that I have like drawing inks that I hadn't been using. So I decided, well, I'm going to work with pen and ink, but I'm not going to use traditional uh, mark making materials. I'm going to use just like old brushes and toothbrushes and popsicle sticks and just let loose and just see what happens and, and just have fun playing with drawing from life again. And so that's where these were born. And so uh, I don't know what day I'm on, to be honest with you. I know 100 days is ending sometime in May. Uh, I haven't been able to do it every single day, but I will have over 100 pieces by the end for sure, because sometimes I do more than one in a day. Uh, and so I, start, I started <laughs> off with just like dipping the popsicle stick or the coffee stir in the ink and just drawing these directly from life, no pencil sketching and then letting them dry. Some of them have watercolor added, some of them don't. And it's just been super fun. Uh, some of them are really big, like uh, 18 by 24, 16 by 20. These are six by nine. And it's just been fun and liberating to just kind of, to just not worry about what the end result is gonna be. Because if you make a mistake, it really doesn't matter. It's just a piece of paper. <laughs> So it's been really helpful to think that way and to, to shift my mind that way. And of course, I can't resist the birds. <laughs> and so uh, in, the, in the middle of all the tulips and the lilies and the ranunculas, I've squeezed in a whole bunch of birds uh, with this process as well. And again, not working with pencil first, just going directly with pen and ink and uh, no, pen and ink, or ink and whatever tool um, is there. And the tool, the tool choice has actually helped me to, again, another, it's been another way of letting loose, so to speak, because if you don't have, if I'm not using a, pen, a tr traditional pen and ink tool, I have less control. So you use a popsicle stick or you use a coffee stir or a stick or a, a chopstick or what else do I have here? Like old stiff brushes. I, I tend to, you don't have as much control of what's happening. And so you're kind of forced into, for me, I just feel like, oh, I can't, I, I can't make that line what I want it to be. So I have to kind of move around and make it work somehow. And so, and then it would add the watercolor afterwards. And so it's been really fun. I feel like it's opened up a whole new way of, you know, finding the form and working with these creatures that I love and uh, working with dripping things. And I think the ranunculus there on the left, on the right, there's, I used walnut ink for that one, um, which was fun, but doesn't, it, it's not waterproof. So it bled a lot when I tried to do other things with it. So, so yeah, so that's kind of the, the journey and I'm gonna stop sharing now. If I can find the stop, my, oh, I have to do this, there we go. And there, and there we are. Okay. Uh, so are there any questions? Oh, well, thank you. Are there any questions yet that anybody has for any of that or where we're at yet? I don't know, there's some in the, is there things in the chat? Nope, that's just me, okay. So on the sketchbook that you mentioned, is that for watercolor specifically or? Yeah, so, so I use a lot of different sketchbooks. Um, I definitely am very picky about the paper inside of the sketchbook. I either get um, sketchbooks that are watercolor sketchbooks or mixed media sketchbooks. Mm. 
because I use a lot of water media in my sketchbooks. And yeah, I like the thicker the paper, the better. So Strathmore has a couple of good ones. Uh, Fabriano has a good one. There's a few different that I've, I've tested a lot. I have piles of them. And I could actually, I can make a materials list after this and send it to Desiree and she can share it with you guys. So you guys can okay, see what you. I have. Was there another question? Did someone else raise their hand? Did I see? No? Okay. All right. Okay. So what I'm going to do now, give me a minute while it, it might get a little awkward <laughs> when I try to shift. I have this fancy thing here with my phone on it. So I have to call in to Zoom with my phone. I'm going to turn my volume down. So just give me a, and then I'm going to do a demo. So just give me a minute to kind of get that done. I'm going to go quiet for a second. So I will jump in because I can share what I shared to begin with, but some of you weren't here. For um, the PG Art Center, we can donate small paintings, miniatures. They're called tiny treasures. It benefits the Art Center. We can uh, donate those pieces now through the end of June to June 24th. They are, uh, they can go up to eight by 10 in size and that includes the frame. And you can donate up to three and then you can participate and we can send it out those directions later by, um, uh, you can buy raffle tickets and then you put them in, in the boxes and we can, there will be more specific um, directions after that, but it's, it's fun to get some other people's work that way and it doesn't really cost a lot and it benefits the Art Center. So I think we're getting close to Jennifer being ready. I am and I'm not seeing, as, as my hands aren't showing up for some reason. We're still seeing, uh, if if you turn, and you turn off the sound on, on yeah. your computer. And I have, can you hear me now? Can you hear me? I can hear you and I see your hand. Oh, I know what I have to do. I have to turn the, the... <laughs> it was on the ceiling, sorry. <laughs> I'm gonna mute myself now. Okay, okay, all right, cool. All right, so like I said, I'm gonna draw these uh, tulips and actually I did a couple of drawings first. Um, let's see, can you see that? I'm gonna put it on view, on speaker view. There we go. Okay, so now I can see it too. Okay, so uh, like I said, I kind of was just doing any kind of paper that was available. So I have, you know, I've got all these different watercolor papers, all different sizes, and that's pretty much what I would just grab and start working on. Um, I did this one earlier, so I'm going to actually add color to this. But again, I worked on this and then decided, oh, I have this extra piece, and I put it here, and then I just I kind of finished the drawing. Uh, and that's how this play kind of happens. Like I don't always, ex I don't always know what's going to be the end result. Uh, so that's the direction I go in, but I'm going to show you first. Um, I use Higgins calligraphy ink, which is a waterproof black ink. And then these are my tools that I draw with all these different old brushes, coffee stirs, um, this is a real stiff old brush. Uh, this is a chopstick. So these are all the things that I draw with the ink. And it's been super fun. And I don't know really why I chose to draw with these. Like I went into my studio and I just had this jar of all these tools that like I probably use for stirring glue or something. I don't know. And was like, oh, I'm going to draw with them, you know, instead of drawing with a traditional pen and ink tool. So I start off and I'm going to go big only because it'll be much easier to draw big here. So you saw the tulips, right? And it's a little bit angled here for me, but I'm going to go for it anyway. Um, this is the one I usually start off with. It's just an old coffee stirrer. Uh, and it's very unpredictable in how much ink kind of comes down. But I'm just going to start drawing. So you guys ask questions as you go if you want. I usually listen to music when I do this, but I won't be doing that today. Uh, and there are times when I think about my, like the composition. And I don't, I think I'm a little bit too, like in my head right now to think about that. But I'm just going to start going for it. I have this thing of tulips and let's see. 
Uh, I'll go this way first. Okay, so as you can see, the control, like I said, is not super great. And what happens with these non-traditional tools is that I tend to draw you know, from my whole arm, my whole arm is moving as opposed to just my pen, my, my hand and my pen. And I definitely love that about uh, gestural drawing when you're using your whole arm and not tightening up with just your hand trying to find form. So I'm being very kind of Loose here, sometimes I don't always get exactly what it looks like, but that's okay, because I'm playing. I think play is super important in art making. Uh, it reminds us that we're doing this because the process is so much fun. And when we, I feel like a lot of times when I get caught up in, oh, but the final piece doesn't look like I wanted it to, or how do I get it where I want it to be, or I go in with this preconceived notion of, that something has to look a certain way, I don't end up making my best work that way. Whereas when I remind myself that I love to do this because this is, um, it's inspiring, it's in my heart. Uh, it's not hard to remind myself that, but when you, as you guys know, when you're you know, creating bodies of work or you're trying to make work for a show, we get lost in, that pro in the idea of what things have to look like as opposed to, oh, what is this process that is so unique to me and my style uh, that makes it special? So, let's see. And I'm not trying to like be exacting, like with the, the flowers that are here. I think that's the nice thing about tulips is that when you get a bunch of tulips, as you, if you guys have ever worked with tulips before, you know, they're just kind of all over the place, right? They just, and there's so much information there, but that's what makes it really cool because you can pick and choose what information you choose to um, put in your composition. And it's still gonna read as a tulip, <laughs> which is pretty nice. Uh, let's see, where am I gonna go this way? Okay. So there's still like a lot of decisions happening, but I am, because I don't start with pencil, I'm less inclined to be worried about those decisions. It's like, okay, what, where, where can I go next? And as the composition starts to sh take shape, I make more decisions on the composition after that. So I don't go in with a, like a real clear idea of what each one is gonna look like. I just know, okay, I want to get the essence of these flowers and their bendy, twisty leaves and they're awesome. I love what, I, I love tulips, how they kind of, we have this one that's coming straight down like this. You know, they get those beautiful curves that we can kind of exaggerate and show. And then I'm gonna bring in this and just, smudge this bring this forward let's see this guy comes like this And when I get kind of like stuck, that's when I start dragging the materials, you know, through the page, you know, across the page. So I'm like, hmm, I don't know if that worked or not. So I'll just make it a big smudge. <laughs> and maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, but that's okay. It's about the process and about like having fun with it. And not being nervous. I've actually never been nervous making one of these. I'm a little slightly nervous right now. <laughs> uh, let's see. Let me go this way. I got a nice curly leaf over here. 
along with that one, and another guy that goes up this way. There. And I love what I love about the unpredictable part of the mark making tools is that you get these real dark, high contrasty areas, which your eye is drawn to. And I can go in, I can, as I work, now that I have kind of a base of things happening here, then I'll go back in and kind of pick and choose where I want things to be darker, like higher contrast and my eye drawn to and develop the each form a little bit more that way, which is definitely like fun to do. And what I also love about doing what with these materials is that I like mistakes are all a part. I don't really call them mistakes. It's just, it's just extra lines. Like I can't erase anything, <laughs> but that's okay. Let's see. Can you guys see all that? That one's there. There we go. Uh, let's see. I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of. So the the vase is kind of where this is a, a square vase. So these, there's these leaves that go over here, out of it. And I'm gonna go straight down like that. And then it goes over here. It goes back that way. Kind of drawing at an angle, which is different. It doesn't look like it there, but I am. And there's a lot more happening. There's a lot of leaves back here and stem work going into the distance behind these guys. Put those in lightly. And then This guy comes back this way. Oops, there we go. All right. I'm gonna um, just shift gears and go to, um, actually I'm gonna use a traditional pen and ink here because at the very end, uh, often, not, not that this would be at the very end for this one, but I will go in and I'll like decide to define, like hone in and define a little bit more some of the areas that I feel like should just have a little bit more definition and uh, use kind of more traditional pen and ink style mark making. And I'll do that oftentimes with the, with the flower forms. And also if I want just thinner lines, like thinner, because those popsicle sticks and stirs don't offer you that type of like thinner line. And then let's see, I have a stiff brush here, this one right here. So this is just an old brush that, I don't know how I ruined it, but I ruined it with something and it's all stiff and hard. And it's a little bit, it gives a little bit of a bolder line, which is kind of cool. So these leaves are, there's a lot of leaves over on this side there before this guy goes that way. All right. So, I was just looking to see if there were questions in the chat, but that's all other information for the chat. Got it. Um, so yeah, so does anybody have any questions or comments yet that they wanna shout out and ask? Cause I can certainly take questions as I go here. I'll take that as a no. <laughs> you spoke about using walnut oil, but that it wasn't waterproof. What do you oh, like about it? Your pros? Yeah, so walnut ink actually, not walnut oil, but walnut ink. I didn't bring it up into the room. Oh, I do, I have it here. It's a, it's a beautiful walnut ink. This is a walnut ink here. Um, it's a beautiful brown. I'll open it up and use it. 
it's a gorgeous brown color, but it's not waterproof. And what I mean by that is that when I use it and if I use watercolor over it, um, it will, can you see how beautiful that is? It's like using, um, I don't know if you can see that color real well. Uh, it works just like watercolor, but it is not waterproof. So the Higgins and even there's a Speed Gabal India ink that is waterproof. And when they dry and I use watercolors on top, the watercolors won't bleed the ink. But if I use walnut ink, this stuff here to do the drawing, the colors will bleed. So it's not as dependable that way, but it's a gorgeous tone. And in fact, I have an example of when I used it for a, um, a final piece. Let me just find it real quickly for you. Uh, so this right here is one of the ones that I did. And uh, all of this, I used it as a wash. That's all walnut ink. Uh, the black was done with the, with the Higgins or the Speedball uh, India ink. The purple was with watercolor. And then this is all walnut ink. So it really, it has those really beautiful blooms like a watercolor does. Uh, it's just, I think it's a gorgeous tone. But yeah, you can't put watercolor on top of it as in terms of a drawing material because then it will, it will bleed. So, uh, okay, so that's kind of like, I would probably, like I would probably do a little bit more on this one. Um, like there's a lot more happening in this area over here, a lot more tulips going out. And so I would really, I would probably, like if I were to keep going, I would be more deliberate and fill out uh, this side of the composition. Uh, because there, not only is it there in the vase, but I feel like it would look better compositionally if it were not so centered looking. And so there's a lot of the blooms going this way. Jennifer, you mentioned that you have a variety of different kinds of watercolor paper. Is there a cold press or a hot press that you prefer or just a mixture of all? Yeah, so it's a mixture of all. These, this process here, this is a hot press. And a lot of the ones that I do with the ink is hot press because the cold, yeah, the cold press has the texture. So the more textured, the harder it is to draw with these funky material, with these funky tools. Um, the, the drawing slide glides really nicely with the, with the smoother paper or the um, mixed media, the mixed media paper for sure as well. Uh, but when I do the watercolors that I actually, you know, put into the gallery, I prefer uh, the cold press for those, the thicker, the better, the, it's almost like cardboard, um, that real heavy, like this is one here. So this has the ink, even though I just said, I don't typically do it, but this is, can you see how thick that is? That's one of those, that's real thick, almost like a cardboardy type. Um, it's Arch, A-R-C-H-E-S, and it's the, they're, it's, I don't think it's rough, but it's a cold press, whatever their heaviest paper is. And so I, I buy this in big sheets and then tear it down. And so this is a remnant um, from something that I tore, from when I tore down earlier. I guess that's the right way to do it. So, so yeah, so, so it's a mixture and a lot of it depends on what the image is and what I want to do with the image. Uh, that will, that will determine what I choose for the paper for sure. So, um, okay. So I can't uh, paint on this one right now because the ink is still wet. The, I don't know if you can see, but there's like real like puddles of uh, lots of ink there. So I have to let that dry before I go and put some watercolor on. However, I have, I'm gonna put it aside. I have this one that I did earlier <laughs> and I will show you kind of my approach for putting watercolor on this. So I have, I'm gonna just show you guys this lovely palette that I have. I don't know if you guys like to collect art supplies as much as I do, but these, this is a palette, oh, someone's, there we go. This is a palette um, that I got, I don't even know where, somewhere, 
I'd have to look, I'll, I'll look at the right name, but there's a lot of potters who make these beautiful clay palettes, um, which are great for gouache or watercolor. Uh, and I just, it's, lo it's lovely. Uh, watercolor paints, this is a set that I have from, these are handmade watercolors. And this is from Pfeiffer Art Supply. I love her watercolors. She's out of, I wanna say Denver. You can, I'll also put this in the supply list. Uh, and they're just, they're beautiful, but actually what I really love about her, I love her watercolors, but the bonus is that every color is named after a bird <laughs> or named for a bird, <laughs> which is just perfect for me. Uh, and then I have a bunch of Daniel Smith um, palettes that I use as well. Uh, so let me just get shift gears here. And uh, all my brushes, watercolor brushes, every shape and size you can imagine. I'm sure you guys have probably accumulated brushes as well. Um, and so oftentimes what I'll do when I want to work with color on these guys is I will make the decision, am I going to like paint the flowers or am I going to play paint around the flowers? So like this one was a little bit of both, right? But I didn't do any green. Um, I have another one where I only did, hang on one second. This one here, where I used, um, it's really tall and long. There we go. Uh, and I decided not to put color in the flowers, but instead use this beautiful, you can see how granulated that, that watercolor pigment is. Uh, it's called Hair and Gray, and it's from the Pfeiffer Art Supply. Um, I just decided to kind of, I'm going to do that and really let this be a, a, a tonal piece without any color um, and just see what happens. So that's the part of play for me that's super important and super inspiring. And then I really love the way this turned out and I need, I would like to do more. I'd like to do a whole series of these, of, of ones that are just, that would match this um, or be, you know, be its own little mini series within the series that I'm working on here. So that, that's what happens for me when I play in art. Like, oh, I'll try this and then I like it or I don't like it. And then I go further with it or not, but it just, it, it gives, it opens up opportunities that I probably wouldn't have thought of if I hadn't started playing in the first place. Okay, so I'm going to now, let's see, on the spot, I get really, wet with watercolor first. And oftentimes what I do with these guys is I just kind of go in and put in splashes of water. And again, I'm playing, so it's okay to just be messy. <laughs> and then start to bring in drips of color. Let's see what happens with it. If it goes beyond the flowers, that's okay. Down there. I'm going pretty hot pink, even though the uh, flowers are um, a little bit more of a pale pink, but that's okay. I'll bring in some contrast. Okay, there's a lot of greens in here. And I'm gonna see what I have for green. I'm actually gonna use, this is just squeezed out onto a watercolor paper. I couldn't remember what greens they were in the pans and I didn't wanna fill them up with the wrong color. So I squirted it out on here. Um, and now I have some nice green to use. And I typically use larger brushes for this part. I wanna, I wanna be loose. I'm not worried about like, you know, being super particular because I want it to be expressive and and just the gesture is there. So the gesture is important in the watercolor part as well. And you'll notice that I definitely, whenever I work with any drawing material, even watercolor brushes, my hand is way up here. And that, that actually forces me to work with my whole arm more. And it allows me 
to be more gestural and not, and it doesn't like make me tighten up and get super tight. I do love like tight little drawings for sure. I do plenty of them, uh, but I also, for me, I love the aesthetic of, of looseness and gesture and expression. There's a lot of yellowish in this. So I'm gonna use some yellow and lighten things up a little bit. Get some highlights. Let's see. Hmm. I'm going to go for it. The vase is like a blue glass, but I'm going to go for it with blue just because I want to get some tone over there to kind of anchor these guys. So each piece definitely feels very experimental. And sometimes I don't know if I'm gonna like the way it looks in the end, um, but I've done so many of them now that it really, it doesn't, I, I'm not too worried about that part. Uh, there's definitely some of them, like some of the pieces I've done in this last 90 something days, I love more than others because there's just, I don't know, a certain, way the watercolor has dried or the certain gesture of a certain flower that I got just right. Um, there's all different reasons for, I'm adding purple just to kind of add some depth in there. Um, I think purple is a good, a nice color for shadow. Also a little unexpected, right? Even though when we look at it, we won't necessarily think it's unexpected, I don't think. Remove it from there though. One thing I always forget to do is always have paper towels nearby and remove. <laughs> I don't know why I always forget that, but I do. So at this point, I would probably let it dry quite a bit before I would go back in and give some more detail on um, some of the flower parts. I thought I did another one today. Hang on a second. Um, I don't know what I did with it. Uh, anyway, I had another one where I was gonna show you how I bring out more detail on a flower. And let me just grab one. Hang on a second. Oh. This one here. I did this one earlier. I'm gonna move these two pieces and let them dry. But this one here, I did a little earlier and I did already start to bring out kind of some shadows here. So I guess what I'm talking about is this one here. So everything's super wet and there's not a lot of, the flowers are just kind of just a blob of color, right? And so you can see here how after that's dry, I'll go in with some real high contrast and to bring in some shadows, which gives it quite a bit more depth, which is nice. And I do use, um, I have a lot of, you know, finer, if you can see those, where am I going? This way? This way, that's better. <laughs> uh, the smaller brushes for that type of work. And I'll just kind of show you what I'm talking about and I'll do it with, maybe a little bit of brown so you can see it. But like I would go in here and just kind of darken that up. And what that does is it adds a little bit of volume 
to these guys because the tulips really do have quite a bit of folds. There's a lot of folds and um, kind of interest. I'm going to use purple because purple seems to work really well with these guys to darken them up. There, that one like set right back, didn't it? This one here. So yeah, so I go in and I'll pull out a lot of detail at the end with um, maybe just add more color too. Um, with finer brushes and bolder colors, like dark, you know, darker values, and to bring out shadows and to bring out a little bit more volume, which is fun. And then I also definitely do it in the leaves because those leaves really, you know, down in here, they can really it gets pretty dark and shadowy in there, even in the vase. And it just makes it really feel like they're really down in there. So it is a lot of layering, um, but it doesn't take too long for things to dry. And then it also like I can stop and be like, oh, OK. Uh, I kind of did it for today or I want to go back into that one later. It really just depends. on when I look at it and what I think. I don't know if you guys could see that. Did that kind of show how it just gives a little bit more volume and depth to those guys? I'm going to um, show you a few, I'm gonna, gonna like do a show and tell because I have piles of these guys and you might guys like seeing them. So that one you saw, that's the, the owl, but I'm just gonna kind of leaf through to kind of show you how experimental these are, but yet they really kind of um, become a body of work. And this one here, I decided to kind of do a lot of squiggle writing. Like you can't read it because it's not legible writing, but it's like just calligraphic first and a wash. And then there's that one. So I've bought a lot of tulips in the past few months. <laughs> and, there, and then again, you know, scraps of paper, like tall and wide. Uh, here's another one with the calligraphic writing first. Here's another bright red one. that's got some pinks and purples a little more blue in the background on that one this is um this is watercolor here it's a titanium buff i believe so jennifer that we see that you're you're developing your your contrast by adding watercolor and yes so i can the topics that most artists want to talk about is con is contrast yeah yep and so you saw with the black and white you're right, I absolutely do. I add a lot of contrast with watercolor. Um, and you saw with uh, the black and white one that we just did, you know, if you could change it to this, like the kind, it's, it's very line work, right? And then this becomes a very tonal piece where you can definitely, your eye is drawn to high contrast areas. So high contrast areas are gonna, it's where your eye is gonna be drawn to, it's gonna make things pop for sure. Um, and you don't necessarily get, like I would have to develop this really as a line drawing to make it work only as a line drawing. So my intent isn't to, for it to work as a line drawing. I would want to go back in and do a lot more work, especially in these areas here and define. And you can give contrast with, with line work. And actually you'll see some of that here in this one. There's a lot of line work in these areas, but then you have these high, these really dark areas of the ink that I deliberately, you know, smushed and smudged or, you know, smudged there to give that high contrast. But yeah, when I'm working with color, when I know I want to add the color to it, which I do for this one for sure, I bring out high contrast with, with, with color and, and tone. And I think the decision making process in terms of color and what colors are going to make, are going to pop. Um, you know, I think that's years of working with color. When you work with color, you just learn so much more about it. And that was really my intent when I first started working with watercolor was I needed to relearn color and how it worked and how to mix it and how to get it to do what I wanted to do. Because I wasn't doing a lot of color mixing in my printmaking. And so, yeah, this one here has a lot of the real high contrast uh, blues and purples uh, for that one. 
And sometimes it's just colors that aren't in the same color family that are going to give you high contrast, right? You can do a lot of, you can do high contrast with in the same color family like this here, where you've got all the pinks and purples and whatnot, but then these tulips pop out from the, the background because the, the colors are just completely different. So you've got high, you've got contrast that way. I think, is that what you're, is that what you're referring to? in terms of contrast? Does that kind of address that? I don't know what somebody, I don't know if somebody just said something or not. But so, yeah. So that is those. Uh, do you have a lot of the birds? So same idea. Jennifer, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. On the, how did you, what instrument did you use to do the, the writing in the background of those previous ones? Oh, probably this pen, this pen right here. And how did you get it to be kind of faint instead of, it oh, well, like it was, it was with a different, it was with watercolor. So this here. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I, I did it with uh, probably watercolor. So not with an ink. Oh, I also have some, um, is it Dr. Martin's or mm -hmm. I think it's Dr. Martin's inks and they come in different colors. I have a set of those. And when I did this way back, this is on the 19th day. So this is way back in January. <laughs> So I'm pretty sure I took, I had a few of like, there was a sepia of Dr. Martin's and a couple, like an ochre. And I think that's what I used for these. And I just dipped this ink pen into it. Okay, thanks. I love those. Yeah, thanks. And so then just a little bit more show and tell. Here's um, more birds. Oh, here's a, a thing of eggs that somebody gave me. Here's another bird. And then here's the owls. And this is all the same, you know, process with the inks. And this is on the real heavy, heavy paper. Um, and, you know, dripping the paper down like this when things pull up. And a lot of that does, a lot of those things are accidental, um, not necessarily deliberate. But yeah, so that's, that's what I got. That's my, that's my playtime. And I think what it does is it just, it opens me up to just allowing myself to play and to um, not be so worried about what the end result is gonna be, um, which is super important. So for me, it is anyway. Um, I highly recommend it because it, it definitely, and you don't ever have to, you also, for me, I also know I don't ever necessarily have to show these to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> I just share them with you guys, but I haven't, I mean, I've shared them a little bit on social media, but not a ton, but it also just, you know, it really is, this is play for me and it's, it's been super, it's just fun and it's, and I feel inspired when I sit down to do these uh, and I look forward to it. I do them almost every day and I really look forward to it. And I think because I know it's just this, like this stress free, free part of making art. I'm not worried, I'm not trying to do a piece that I know has to be in a frame for a gallery show. And so with that out of my head, I, um, I tend to be, I tend to be loose and more experimental and not worry about, oh, am I choosing the right color? And I just choose a color and go for it, um, which is really nice. Um, so, all right. I think I'm gonna turn off my phone and go back on to talk over here, so let me do that. There, am I here? Yeah, okay. So there, so um, I'm happy to answer more questions if you have any, I don't know if, if you can, if, can everyone hear me now? Yeah, okay. Um, I think I kind of covered like what I do for this and it, it, like I said, it's very, it's very relaxing and 
when I make mistakes, I don't worry about it. I just have to view it as just a piece of paper <laughs> and then and then keep going. And then sometimes even if I like the piece, I feel like it's not going a direction that I really like, I will, um, I'll just, I'll put it aside and start something new. Or all of a sudden it starts to turn into something that I really like, which is also really fun. So. What do you do um, or who do you like to look to for inspiration for your work and what are some things you do to help feed your soul yeah well art making art absolutely feeds my soul when i feel stuck in a mood or like i need to kind of escape or get grounded i now open up a sketchbook or grab a piece of watercolor paper and i'm just like i'm just going to do something that i really want to do and oftentimes it's i really just need to draw this owl today and i'll do that and I think I do that more and more as opposed to looking outside for inspiration, like looking at other artists. When I, so I think social media is awesome, but it's also, a, it can be a killer for your self-esteem as an artist, because I feel like mo so many times I'm just looking and seeing, why aren't I doing that? Or why are they, <laughs> they seem so much more successful than me. And that's, that's a horrible, like, that is like toxic. It is so hard. And so I have, I kind of made a decision a few years ago. I do use social media, like I use Instagram and I have a, a fan base or a patron base or followers that I am very interactive with. I do have an email list, but I don't, my email list, I only send out emails every couple of months. Um, but I found that if I went down that rabbit hole of social media and started looking at a lot of other artists, I ended up not making as much work for myself. And so now I really I turn off my phone, I get grounded, I collect photographs, you know, either out and about or from, I have a couple of bird photographers that send me their work and I'll, okay, which one, which one do I really want to draw today? And that's what I'll do. But I do, one thing that I do do is I look at abstract artists and I look at abstract artists because there's some, I don't do abstract art. I don't feel like I've ever, been, I've tried it a few times, but it's not something that comes from in here. So it's really hard for me. Uh, but what I do is I will look at what they do. I love, there's a lot of gesture in abstract art that I don't find in my representational art. I love, there's a lot of color choices that are used that I find surprising. And so I actually do look at abstract artists for just for inspiration, kind of clear my head like, oh, I love those colors. And then, you know, I, I don't feel it as intimidating as when I look at uh, people who do work that like other bird artists, for sure. I don't think I even follow any because it's just it's too much for my brain to handle. <laughs> if that makes sense. I don't know if anybody can relate to that, but that's definitely and just being out in nature like i love you know i mean bird watching is a huge part of my family history and my past and my current world and so um that's you know watching birds being up close and personal with birds and watching them and and being out in birding is a huge part of what i do as well and that definitely inspires me to choose what i'm going to paint next um for a bird absolutely so yeah Anything else? Can you see chat? There's lots of wonderful. Actually, let me just um, open. Oh yeah. Oh yay. Yeah, yeah definitely lots try it, you things. guys. Collect a whole bunch of just like collect old brushes and toothbrushes and just play. See what happens. And again, don't worry. Like really just let loose the idea of you're trying to make something that looks good. Just just do it. I also I think a, a question that comes to me often is how do like from younger artists in particular, but how do you develop your own style? And whenever anybody asks me that, or when people ask me who I, who I look to, um, I think it's super important. A way that you can develop your own style is by drawing from life, as opposed to drawing from um, a photograph or looking at other people's artwork. Because if you're drawing from life and that's the only thing you're looking at, your hand and your eye are gonna end up dictating what you're doing and you will develop a style. And I think that that's, to me, that's what's so invaluable about drawing from life. I don't get to draw birds from life very often because they just don't sit still and you just don't, you're not up close and personal, you know, close enough. But like the tulips and the flowers, 
and they are. And so I, I mean, this isn't, I don't have any other work like this. This is a whole new body of work for me, so to speak, but it's really, I think it can't, it's definitely reminiscent of my other work because it's all about drawing and mark making. And so it's that it's still me and it's still there. Um, but drawing from life. So when you, I think it's just a really important thing. I'm sure a lot of you know that and do that, but that's definitely something that I'm asked often. It's like, what, what's, what's really helpful in developing a body of work. And for me, it's making sure I'm drawing from life for sure. So. Yeah, but thanks for um, thanks for having me. Thanks for all, all the kind comments. Now, it's sweet to read them all. I'm reading them all right now. Yeah, and I'll make up. I'll I'll write down the list of all the stuff I used today, and I'll send it to you, Desiree, probably tomorrow morning, um, so you can share it with everyone. And include. I'll also include um, some of the sketchbooks, uh, the, the materials that I use, or the sketchbook styles that I use. Um, those were... Jennifer, do you teach as well? Well, I, I have a workshop that I'm teaching. I don't teach any private students right now. I just don't have the space to do that. Um, and, but I am teaching a workshop up in Oregon in September. I teach there every year. And this year it happens to be in September that they scheduled me. And it's this year, it's a workshop called art the artist actually helen you would like this it's the artist book uh it has words and images words and images the art of the artist book so i couldn't think of the name of it i know so it's i'm and it, we can, you can do it online too you don't have to come to oregon to take it they're offering an online version yeah so i'll put that in the i'll put the link to that just because you guys might be interested in seeing you know the way what, what it is up there but so I do teach just a few times a year and they're typically at a workshop that I go to and teach at the workshop. I don't have a, a studio that's really um, conducive to teaching here. So, yeah. <laughs> but I think that you're on. Uh, you're Thank on. you so much. <laughs> you're so welcome. We really appreciate, yeah, we really appreciated you. Uh, coming in and doing a demo for us today. Yeah, you're so welcome. Thanks for having me. And you guys, I think you'll have my email and my contact info. So if anybody has any further questions, certainly reach out. I'm pretty good. If I don't get back to you, you know, usually within a couple of days, I manage to get to the enormous number of emails that we receive. But uh, good. And, and if any, everyone doesn't know, you can click on the chat down at the bottom of the screen and your chat box will come up. And at the very top, you'll find Jennifer's email. She has invited you to uh, contact her directly or her e uh, website. And you can also see her current works on Instagram. Yeah. And is that uh, under Jennifer Anderson on Instagram? Oh, Instagram is ravenpress underscore art, but I'll, I'll put that, I'll put all that in a document too. Wonderful. Um, and that's where that's actually, believe it or not, even though I don't love social media, it Instagram is where I definitely keep the most updated work because <laughs> it's easy. Updating a website is just like, for me, it's onerous and I hate doing it. So I haven't updated a website in years, but I do have a shop website, which I shared with you, Desiree. Um, and mm -hmm. uh, that does have a bunch of my, you know, some of my work as well as uh, my artist book. I don't know. I know Helen knows about my book, but I don't know. So the sketchbooks, um, this past year, uh, I, if you guys can see this, I published a book and it's, it's all pages from my artist journals and sketchbook. Ooh. Yeah. So you can, um, so yeah, so that this was this sister to big, I had a solo show at the gallery and this was a companion to the solo show. So the solo show was mostly in oil paints. And it was oil paintings that I developed from imagery from my sketchbooks. And so that was kind of the theme. And it was really um, the express, like it was really, I was trying to express the importance of my sketchbooks to me as an artist and in my art practice. And so I published this book. It's like, it's a hundred and something pages. It's called Natural Inclinations, Pages from an Artist Journal. Um, has a lot of my little scribblings in it. And yeah, over a hundred pages of work from my directly from my sketchbooks. So this is actually on my big cartel site. It's also over at the Carmel Art Association. So you can also, if you're interested, 
it's available there as well. Um, but yeah, so yeah, and I have a show in, um, I have a two person show at the, at the Carmel Art Association in August. It's just a small show, it's just the showcase part. But um, if you guys, if you get on my mailing list, uh, if you wanna be on my mailing list, you'll, you can get an announcement for that. And it's, it's gonna be uh, drawn from nature. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Uh, and I believe <laughs> I'm doing mostly big charcoals for it. I haven't totally decided yet, but yeah. So that's where you'll see more of my work. Wonderful. Thank yeah. you so much. You're so welcome. And thanks for having me. It was nice to, to meet you all. I love our question. Um, you seem, we see series happening here. Is that, is that mostly how, how you tend to work? Like it you, is, during the hundred days, is that tulips or is that something specific or? Well, the hundred days was the, 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 um, the material. So it was ink and watercolor and ink, not using only a pen and ink, but using just different materials just to have more expression and less control, like seeing what I could create with less control, if that makes sense. And like I said earlier, the mark, mark making is so important to me as an artist. I love that mark making process. I love the results of mark making that it made sense to kind of play with that. But yes, yeah, series do develop. I love to work in series. I feel like when you, well, for me, when I work in a series, I learn so much about one, the, the subject matter, and I become super familiar with it. And it, therefore it becomes fluid. It becomes kind of fluid when I start working with it. When I work with a new subject matter, I have to learn about the subject matter and I tighten up and I'm not, I don't fully understand it. And so it takes a while to kind of find a, um, create a piece that I'm really happy with. So when I work in a series, subject matter and or material, I find that the familiarity then gives me such comfort in when I'm ready. I don't ever feel, I feel less intimidated when I start new pieces. Like, like when I started doing watercolors back in two, well, I don't know what year it was, four or five years ago, um, I was super intimidated at first. And but now I don't think twice about getting out a real expensive piece of water, you know, the ni really nice watercolor paper, that heavy stuff and just going for it. Like I don't, it, I don't have that like fear anymore because I'm so comfortable with painting birds. And um, yeah, there's a comfort level that happens, I think. So. So we're all smiling and. <laughs> <laughs> feel inspired and are there any other questions or comments there are a couple more little writings down in chats Thank yep you. so i think we're we're good all right thank you i i feel <laughs> wonderful well, I'm, good. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go try now pen and ink it's not something i've approached right exactly and not so a pen I'm, i mean i don't have pens but i have i have popsicle sticks yeah popsicle sticks <laughs> It's a good, a good way to use them. Um, chopsticks. We all have those, you know, tons of chopsticks in our drawer, right? Just go to that junk drawer that everybody has. I have like three of them and you'll find things you can draw with. <laughs> Very good. Well, thank you. And it's so nice to see everybody here today. Yeah. Uh, nice to see everybody virtually. And thanks for spending the hour with me. I appreciate it. Thanks, Bobby. Thanks, thanks Jennifer. You're welcome. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. 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 Thank you.